Hello and welcome to Working Historians, a podcast series where we discuss what historians do with their lives. I am Rob Denning, Associate Dean for Liberal Arts for Southern New Hampshire University's online history programs. Today, Superman's pal Jimmy Fennessy and I are speaking with Matthew Merz, a graduate of SNHU's online undergraduate history program, about his work as a conflicts analyst for a law firm, Ackerman LLP, which is one of the coolest job titles I've ever heard. Let's find out what that is. And what is your name and what do you do? Hi, my name is Matthew Mers, and I'm a conflicts analyst at Ackerman LLP. Matthew, conflicts analyst. That is something we're going to have to uh, circle back to for sure. But let's start, well, maybe not at the beginning, but further back in time. Um, How did you become interested in history and how did you make your way to being a um, conflict analyst? Yeah. um, Well, history and social studies were always my favorite subject ever since I was in grade school. You know, I remember kind of uh, getting that history textbook and um, just kind of staying up late in in the room with the flashlight, and I would read the whole history book, um, the textbook, in a matter of days, and I would be just kind of like finished with it. And I was always just uh, really fascinated as a kid. It just, I think it um, it uh, kind of fascinated me to think that no matter um, how far removed that we were from that I was from other people in um, place and time, that um, you know they were. Homo sapiens just like me, and that just kind of uh, fascinated me. So I think initially I was really interested in the old stuff, like, you know, prehistory, um, ancient history, antiquity, things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, when they start to ask you uh, what you want to do when you grow up, I started to think about it. And, um, you know, I knew that uh, Batman wasn't a real thing, and the chances of playing for the Boston Celtics were slim to none. So I thought, well, I want to be an archaeologist just like Indiana Jones because, you know, that's realistic, right? Nice. So so after high school, I um, went to Ohio State for a couple of years. Um, my initially uh, declared my major as um, to be anthropology. But after a few 100 level anthropology classes, I realized that it wasn't like the Indiana Jones movie at all. Um, it was more like digging through, you know. Um, feet of dirt with like a toothpick and a toothbrush and you're looking for like tiny little pottery shards and that seemed like kind of tedious labor that wasn't um, so exciting so I thought to myself well maybe somebody else could dig all this stuff up and then we could just talk about what they find and I would uh, switch my major to history Um, but I ended up um, you know dropping out of school in my early 20s probably for a lot of the same reasons that a lot of people do in their late teens and early 20s went and worked in the restaurant industry for quite a while, but, you know, I always um, kind of regretted not finishing my degree and um, I became kind of unhappy in the um, restaurant industry. And um, I felt like um, not having a degree was holding me back from, you know, having more opportunities. Um, So I kind of uh, answered that call to adventure and enrolled at uh, Southern New Hampshire University to finish my degree. Um, I enrolled in 2017. And then I graduated in July of 2020. Um, And yeah, so my concentration there was uh, Middle Eastern studies. And uh, my capstone paper was called uh, The Crusades, A Brief Historiographical Overview. So yeah, so then um, that was my educational background. Um, And then, you know, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do um with a degree but i had the sense that you know i would have there would be more opportunities for me and i was just kind of um you know looking at different job listings and thinking about the skills that i had developed um as a student of history and um i thought to myself that um i had gotten pretty good at you know doing research and writing because you know uh, at southern new hampshire university we write a lot of uh, research papers and started to think about, you know, some of the skills that I developed and I was reading job descriptions and I read the job description for my current job, um, which is a conflicts analyst at a law firm. And I thought when I read the, read the job description of, you know, what they were looking for, that um, I had all those skills. So um, I didn't really know that was a thing until I started, but, you know, I found, I uh, kind of stumbled into it when I was looking for a job and um, yeah, here I am. That's amazing. It's also, um, 
a really good uh, pointer to any history majors or potential history majors out there. Um, you learn some really good and important skills that can transfer. So just because you study history doesn't mean that you're setting yourself up to be a historian, even though that might be the most fascinating job in the world. Um, you know, you don't have to go into academia. There are plenty of other options. Um, so interesting that, so your background was the Middle East, not that that would have prepared you for understanding and analyzing conflict at all. Um, but could we dive a little bit into some of those skills that you're talking about um, in relation to transferable skills uh, that, that helped you with the work that you're doing now? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, right. You, you know, I don't, you know, knowing uh, the, what caused World War I or why Rome fell aren't maybe necessarily important for the job that I have now. But some of the other skills are important. Um, one is, um, you know, I think that uh, if you have finished a history degree, you can probably read and write as well as nearly anyone else um, because it's so reading and writing heavily, you know, um, heavy. Um, and um, lawyers um, kind of smith words for a living, right? So um, you're kind of reading things that can be like complex and um, nuanced. And um, so your reading comprehension has to be you know, pretty high when you're when you're kind of uh, trying to figure things out and how things are connected, because you know words can be, I guess, chosen. Uh, specific words are chosen for a specific purpose and for a specific meaning, especially um, you know in the legal field. And um, not only that, but um, I think just uh, being information literate and kind of having an idea of um, you know what is a good source of information, what's a credible source of information. Um, where can I find the information? Um, we use like a lot of um, things that you use as a historian, like, you know, primary sources. Um, you know, I might look at uh, government databases um, for documentation. Um, you know, it could be like a SEC filing or um, a uh, the county property records or things of that nature, secret um, secretary of state filings. And then, you know, and then there's databases that have information and, you know, how do you use those databases? It's kind of similar to what you would be doing with like, you know, an online library or something like that. Um, and then, you know, you have to be able to kind of concisely summarize um, the information that you have gathered and kind of, um, you know, kind of boil it all down and, um, communicate that in a kind of a concise and clear way for um, the attorneys to take a look at. Um, and it takes, you know, critical thinking skills, I think, which are important um, for the job. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think like the research and the critical thinking were like two of the major skills that you helped to, that uh, I developed as a student of history that kind of helped me in my job now. So uh, obviously, without giving it away, any you know confidential client data or anything like that, what does a conflict analyst do? Yeah, well, I think that um, kind of your overarching purpose is um, risk mitigation, and um, that takes shape in a couple of ways. Um, the first way that a law firm might want to mitigate risk is, um, you know, they they if you have a new client they may be concerned about the reputation of the law firm. You know, for example, if the um, client kind of has a toxic rep, rep um, a toxic reputation, say, you know, they're a, I don't know, like a, a drug cartel member or, um, you know, white supremacist or something like that, a law firm might not want to take them on as a client because um, it could be, you know, bad for the image of the law firm. You know, um, other clients that they have, currently might drop them. People might not want to hire them in the future. So if you have a new client coming in, you want to do a, you know, quick uh, checkup on them and kind of figure out, you know, who is this person or entity, you know, um, how do they make their money? You know, what what do they do? Things, things like that. And um, just kind of uh, check them out and see if like anything, if there's any kind of red flags that pop up. So you can send that off for someone to kind of review and then they can like make that decision. Um, now the second, uh, kind of risk that you're looking at here is um, when you have a, these large law firms that they, they have hundreds of lawyers or over a thousand attorneys employed for the law firm. Um, so basically what happens is um, you'll have new business come in. It could be from a brand new client that the law firm has never represented before, or it could be an existing client. 
and um, you know they have a new matter that they want to hire the law firm to do. So it'll come to me, and you know I'll take a look at it, and I'll see you know who are the parties involved, um, and uh, you want to make sure that um, we're, you can't represent a law firm can't represent both, say, the plaintiff and the defendant because that would be a conflict of interest if um, they did that unless they signed a waiver saying it was okay. So if you, so if you have you know hun, over you know hundreds of attorneys, maybe over a thousand attorneys, you have to make sure that if this attorney wants to represent Company A and you know they want to sue Company B, you have to make sure that another attorney in your law firm doesn't already represent Company B because that would be a conflict of interest. Um, or another, or even if it's not a conflict of interest, if say you know Company A is your client and um, they want to sue you know, company B and company B is also your client, even if it's not a conflict of interest, if company B, you know, uh, has a, does a lot of, has a lot of work for the law firm and, you know, they're billing them a lot of money, they might not be too happy if they get uh, something on the law firm's letterhead saying they're being sued by our law firm when, you know, they hired our law firm. So they might drop you as a, um, you know, might drop the law firm. Um, so those are kind of like where the conflicts come in. And, and um, what I do to kind of help make sure that uh, that doesn't happen, we don't have a malpractice suit or, you know, a situation kind of like I described earlier, is I do some uh, research on the corporations. You know, I'll say, I'll find out, um, do they have a parent company? Um, who is their parent company? Um, what subsidiaries do, um, do the, do this, does the company have? And so I'll, I'll do that kind of research, make sure that it is, a, in fact, a real company and, you know, not something like ma made up and, you know, verify their address and whatnot and figure out what it is they do, how they make their money. Um, I'll take their parent company and their subsidiaries and um, I'll kind of uh, compile that information and then I'll run that through an internal database um, and see if anything pops up with the law firm's internal database. And then I'll evaluate those results and any potential, conf you know, summarize those results. And then um, any potential conflict of interest, um, I will let the attorneys, let an attorney know so they can kind of clear that up uh, before they move forward. So, you know, there won't be any conflict of interest or, you know, maybe they, they won't be able to take on the matter or they'll, they'll have to do some work to get the conflicts cleared. Yeah, that's uh, very cool. That's actually, um, I think I've mentioned in the podcast before that at one point after I graduated and was on the, basically all I could cobble together were various adjunct jobs. I went back to um, Columbus State, um, Matthew, you know, the, you, you know the area. So Columbus State Community College uh, to look into getting a paralegal degree because I was looking for something different um, because I didn't want to be a full-time adjunct. Um, and they, they were talking about a lot of that, a lot of those tasks, they, they, the classes emphasize the importance of all of those things because yeah, there's conflicts of interest that you have to avoid and you have to make sure you do your due, due diligence on all of your clients so that you're not caught unawares. And um, so, yeah, it sounds like that's a lot of the, the type of stuff that I would have been doing if I had, uh, if I had continued to go that route, if this other SNHU thing hadn't opened up. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, really similar. Um, I think one of the main differences like the paralegal does more, you know, legal research where they may be looking at case law and things of that nature, um, where I'm doing more corporate research and looking at corporate structures and things like that. And, um, you know, kind of uh, verifying, you know, um, the existence of things and um, their address so we know where to send the bill and, you know, to kind of, uh, like you said, do the due diligence and make sure that, um, that uh, you know, this isn't... Uh, a person or entity that, you know, um, has kind of a toxic um, reputation that might kind of hurt the firm's rep firm from a PR standpoint. But yeah, that's similar, similar. And so as a, as a college graduate, you had graduated through your BA degree in history. Um, how did you, you, you mentioned that obviously you, you got the job here. So what were you looking specifically in the legal field or how did you stumble across this listing? I was just looking at different uh, jobs on, I think I was like looking, you know, on your regular job sites like LinkedIn and Indeed. Um, I think I might have typed in keywords like research and um, analyst and saw different jobs that popped up. I wasn't necessarily looking for the legal field, but I did, when I saw this one pop up, I said, okay, I can do that. 
and you know it, it seemed kind of interesting and you know to be honest with you it, it, it can be interesting because you know like you said i can't mention um specific information about clients but sometimes you'll see something in the news and and then here it is you know um across your desk and you're like here you are you're kind of looking at something that you just saw in the news um and it's also interesting to see what um all of these businesses do you know all the, just the wide variety of uh, goods and services that um that people produce you know um because it's like it's your imagination really has a hard time i guess kind of grasping you know like all the variety of different types of businesses that there are out there so that can be pretty interesting too just to kind of see what what all these different businesses do and it's great to hear that you were searching for different keywords the problem that i think a lot of graduates run into is when they go to look for jobs they look specifically for keywords history and historian and yeah. that that is not always going to get you where you want to be <laughs> so it's it's in very important for students to realize that they have a lot of skills that don't necessarily have to have the word history in them they've learned a lot of really cool things in pursuit of that degree that they can use elsewhere and so yeah searching for those skills and keywords for those skills can be much more uh, you, you can get a lot more results and a lot more success looking for those than strictly by typing in historian because those jobs, there just aren't many jobs that have the word historian in the job title. And so it, it's uh, it, you kind of have to look at other in other directions. And so that's great to hear that you were doing, doing different type, types of uh, keywords. Yeah, those jobs tend to be uh, very specific in very specific areas, whether it's like local historians at like a a community museum <laughs> or something, you know, sadly not a lot of full-time uh, teaching positions at in higher ed, but definitely adjunct positions. Um, but yeah, like. Uh, but even those are going to require a, a much higher, you know, advanced degrees. And so a uh, student uh, graduating from the BA program, who's not interested in going into a grad degree. Yeah. They're going to, they're, they're going to have even fewer options because they don't have the, the adjunct route that they could go. Um, yeah. Because ever because in this job market, when there's a glut of PhDs and MAs out there, the odds of getting a, a teaching job with a BA is pretty minimal these days. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that um, you know one of the most popular majors for students is like business, but um, kind of a someone kind of um, looked at people who have history degrees and they found out that if they go into business, they end up doing just as well. Um, in their careers as those with a business degree, maybe not right away with their first job, but, you know, you still develop like skills, you know, different set of skills, or maybe kind of view things a little differently um, than the business majors. And it kind of seems to work out well for them. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of research and, you know, um, I think Google is one of the companies that kind of came out with, with research on this where, uh, yeah, the, the, what are kind of traditionally called the soft skills or the human skills where you can learn to interact with people, you can think problems through, that tends to be pretty successful in the long run. In the short run, sure, the coder, the you know, the programmer may get a better higher starting salary just out of college because they have a very concrete skill set that people are that are people are looking for. But in the long run, though, yeah, it tends to be the people with not even necessarily history, but humanities type backgrounds or liberal arts backgrounds tend to do much better over in the long run because they're not quite constrained by the job title that other uh, fields may be constrained with. And there's just the kind of the sense that you need to have the human touch kind of across the business. Um, and so the, that that puts folks in a, in a favorable position. But again, it tends to usually take the kind of the long run for those the salary to kind of catch up to the people that get the high salaries directly out of college. Yeah, and I think that it's just part of it too. I think is just being able to market the skills that you learn um, to your prospective employer. So when you're you know sitting down in that interview, um, you can kind of explain to them the skills that you've developed and um, you know how how they apply to the job that it is that you're looking to do. Yeah, so that's great. So um, I think we've so we've covered the various skills. We've covered um, the, uh, the 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 work that you do. Um, is there anything that you th um, that you think may be of interest uh, to history students that we haven't really covered yet at this point? That that uh, based on your own experience. 
Well, you know, I, I think that uh, the type of job that I have is like one that um, someone who ha with, you know, has a background in history can really excel at. Um, they've kind of, uh, my, the feedback at the two law firms that I've worked for was that, you know, I picked things up really quickly and actually they hired another, um, someone who had just graduated with the history degree, like, you know, after me. So it seems like that, um, you know, they felt like that the skills you develop studying history are a good fit for um, the type of job that I have, you know, where you, where it's kind of, you're synthesizing all that information and you're able to do research and, you know, think critically and uh, the reading and writing skills, you know, using online databases and all the different things that you pick up. Yeah, that's great. So um, congratulations on finding the, uh, finding work that uh, has, has some value and also takes advantage of the skills that you learned. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And have you been able to um, continue diving into history for your own love of it um, or with being a professional now and out of school? Has that kind of gone by the wayside? <laughs> you know, one of the great things is about this is, um, you know, I get to work remotely so I can listen to like audiobooks um, while I work. Um, I'm a big fan of audiobooks and I like to read. Um, I read quite a lot or quite a bit, I should say. And um, I and I read primarily history books because it's my kind of my um, academic interest and uh, you know, still kind of uh, what I really enjoy reading. So I read a lot of history books still, even though I'm not a student anymore. Well, speaking of things that you enjoy doing, uh, did you have anything to recommend for us this week? Um, well, I think um, a history book that I would recommend um, if you haven't read it, um, it's not brand new. I think it came out in like 2014, but uh there's a book called Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, and it's by a Israeli historian named Yuval Noah Harari. Um, and after this book came out, he's kind of become kind of a bit of a public intellectual. You, once you um, know who he is, you probably you may see him um, kind of interviewed by different people. He's been on um, Bill Maher's show. Uh, he spoke at like Davos, which is like kind of like the big meeting of like world leaders and powerful executives and he's uh his book's pretty interesting i think that um after reading it it kind of helped um it was insightful and it kind of um helped to influence my worldview um especially when he kind of talks about how much of um the world that we live in is what he would call intersubjective you know it's not an objective fact they are things that are um basically true because um we collectively believe them to be and you know kind of how like kind of like laws for example um you know they're kind of uh figments of the human imagination that um we all have decided that uh are true so they're true and i think that um that's kind of uh where history kind of lies and like what you study is like kind of like those ideas and you know those uh intersubjective realities so it's a really interesting book, I think, in, in that way. And it kind of uh, opened my eyes to a lot of things. Okay, that sounds very cool. Uh, Jimmy, do you have anything for us? Sure, yeah. Um, as you know, I'm always fascinated with popular culture. Um, one of the things I always find interesting watching television shows and movies, for example, is the use of history as a backdrop. Um, but it really takes a a good writer and a good show to actually weave the um, weave the elements of history into the narrative and the story to push it forward. So one of the uh, shows that I've really liked over the past couple of years is Dairy Girls. So this is um, the story of three teenage girls and one teenage boy in, um, in the city of Derry in Northern Ireland. And it's set during the nineties um, with the backdrops backdrop of the troubles happening. Um, the show I think starts around 1994. So we're talking about um, the provisional IRA um, cessation of um, military activity. We're talking about the loyalist ceasefire. And for the most part, the first couple of seasons use history in exactly the way that I was talking about. So you'll have, um, you know, the army or um, the British army or um, uh, somebody from the IRA and they'll kind of be characters in the story, but they help to move the story along in a funny way. And maybe events happen in the background. 
But the final season is really interesting. It's set in 1998 um, during the referendum on the Northern Ireland Good Friday Agreement. Um, And it becomes pretty central, not only to the storyline, but to the relationship with some of the characters. And I'm going to leave it at that. You know, that uh, series, that series, final series just came out recently. So it might be a little bit um, too soon to do spoilers. But uh, for anybody who knows or has studied the... um, the troubles and the the history in Northern Ireland and the relations between the the populations um, and their different ways of seeing the world and interpreting the world. Um, it's a I found it to be a really fascinating show that's light at moments, but weaves in some pretty heavy um, historical elements as well. Is that on Netflix or Apple TV or I forget where, that where is that? was uh, Netflix. I believe okay. those streaming services now cross in my mind because like. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I watched the show over here and this one here. Um, I believe it's Netflix. Okay, cool. That sounds interesting. I'll check that out. Um, mine is, it's not really a recommendation, I guess. It's just something that's just kind of in the news. And it's just the continuation of the uh, culture war, I guess, is the best term for it that's been going on regarding history for the last couple of years. Um, last year, CRT, uh, the... Um, critical race theory was kind of the, in the news all the time. And it was used kind of as a, as a, a, a division in the, uh, you know, the, the midterm elections last year, this year, uh, though, even though the elections are done, the culture war is still raging. And so anyone that's been paying attention to the news lately may have heard about, um, these changes that are to have that state governors are put, trying to put in place in, um, Virginia and Florida that are kind of changing the standards for historical study for um, students, uh, usually K through 12 students in those states. And it's not just those states, but it's happening around the around the country. And so historians have kind of found themselves on a multi front conflict for, you know, we're running on a couple of years now, but the most recent blow ups in Virginia and uh, in Florida are just kind of the most recent and they've been in the news. Um, The College Board in their AP history courses in the face of resistance from the governor in, in Florida, they have tried to, they have started to remove African-American st- studies and standards from their AP uh, history courses. Virginia has a new um, curriculum that they've been kind of de- debating over uh, regarding history learning in uh, K through 12, which the AH, the American Historical Association has so far uh been leading kind of the charge against, and I'm sure the AHA will probably weigh in on the Florida thing too, but it just happened too recently. But the AHA is upset that the Virginia standards are um, focusing more on kind of the old style of learning of history of, you know, memorizing facts instead of critical thinking. Um, the The new standards basically eliminate discussions of fascism. They eliminate discussions of labor unions and the contributions of unions to working conditions, that kind of thing. They're ignoring indigenous peoples. And so these standards are unacceptable to a lot of historians, um, but that's just kind of where we are these days. And so I'll post links to a couple of the articles that have popped up recently on that topic in the show notes for this episode. Um, again, it's not really a recommendation, but it is something if you're historically minded, you may want to take a look at, look at if you haven't already. Um, even if you're not a history teacher, it is going to be affecting how people learn history in certain, in a bunch of states going forward. And so it's definitely worth worth your time taking a look at. So, you know, it's just the culture wars. It's just an exhausting topic, but it's never going away. So yeah. what do we do? It's a great, great conversation, though. I mean, being aware, I mean, sc- school starting, you know, in grade school is where we learn history and learn how to interact with the past. Um I don't know if, uh, so I read an article, this was so interesting. So I read an article, I found it interesting. Um, and it might be interesting to the two of you being in Ohio. So I made a um, kind of a terrible joke to you earlier today via text, Rob, about homeschooling. And I don't think you saw it as a, a joke, but it was actually in reference to the dissident homeschool um, topic that's been popping up recently. So I read an article on Vice a couple of days ago um, about this dissident homeschool, which is apparently this couple in Ohio who are sharing neo-Nazi materials to uh, with oh, other right. homeschooling parents. Um, and the more you dive into it, the scarier it gets. Um, but it was just, then it got picked up by national media and it's kind of all over the place now this story has just blown up um so you you have vice which used to be this culture rag way back in the 90s now like breaking you know 
this like um, hard hard invest or like in depth investigations breaking these like major stories, which I find really interesting. The uh, transition of Vice from Party Magazine to what it is now, Culture Magazine. But um, it's but the yeah. Teen Vogue of the twenty twenties. <laughs> The Vogue of the 2020s, is that what you said? Teen, teen Vogue um, at the magazine and uh, gained a reputation a few years back because it was like one of the hardest hitting journalistic outlets uh, in like popular magazines for, because a lot of magazines had laid off their political staff. And for some reason, Teen Vogue just ran with it. <laughs> and so they broke a whole bunch of stories and they were all over the news a few years ago. Uh, they And everyone was kind of scratching their heads of why is one of the premier political voices of this generation is it why is it teen vogue of all places <laughs> that's amazing i think um not recently but i think uh didn't rolling stone go through a similar transition where it used to be mostly focused on music and culture and then they started to um do in-depth analysis of of politics and culture um which which was really that the, the transition of magazines and what they cover is really interesting but um yeah. but i found this to be a, a relevant topic, you know, not historical, but it deals with how we teach and learn history um, or don't learn history for that matter with um, with how some of these new regulations are trying to shut down actually learning what, what happened in the past and changing it. All right. Well, on that happy note, I think we can wrap up here. <laughs> so okay. uh, Matthew, thank you for taking the time to talk to us tonight. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Matthew. And thank you all for joining us today. This episode appears on the Working Historians podcast feed, and you can subscribe to that feed on any podcast app, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Soundbean, Amazon Music, Pandora, or whatever else you prefer. That way you won't miss any episodes, and you'll continue to hear about all the other cool stuff that historians do with their lives. This podcast does not represent the views of Southern New Hampshire University, despite my affiliation with it. If you have any questions or comments for this or any of our other podcasts, please send us a message to workinghistorians at gmail.com or follow our Twitter feed at Work Historians. For Matthew Mers and Jimmy Fennessy, I'm Rob Denning. Take care of yourself and each other. Did I just say sound bean? Whatever. <laughs>